Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Shklov, and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. There are some things that laws cannot control, but perhaps parents can. This is especially true in the digital age. My guest today is Lauren Pear. In today's special program, Lauren will share the counterintuitive practice that Silicon Valley, Valley executives use to give their own children an edge in today's overwhelming and constant technological environment. This is kind of a secret that these Silicon Valley executives have. Lauren is passionate about, passionate about passing this secret on to others and helping families navigate the uncharted waters of raising confident, capable, and resilient children in the digital age. Lauren, welcome. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's great to be here. Yeah, well, you have some good points that I never knew about. And first of all, though, Tell me a little bit about yourself. What's your background, your education, where you grew up, uh, professional background? Yeah. Please. So um, I was born and raised here in Oahu. I went to Punahou School and then went on to the University of Pennsylvania, where I studied economics. I started my career in finance in New York City. I worked as a researcher for the New York Federal Reserve, a multi-strategy hedge fund, and Goldman Sachs. Um, but several years ago, I left Wall Street. I'm um, from a fifth gener I'm fifth generation from a missionary family, and I love Hawaii, and I decided to return home. And since leaving Wall Street, a common thread on the projects I've been working on is that they involve education, workforce development, and public policy um, responding to changes that came about due to the digital age that we're all living through now. Okay, so well, you you were you were on Wall Street, and I know you uh, had a successful career, you were doing financial things, what, what really made you change? What, what brought you back? I mean, I, I hear what you say about the love of Hawaii, but you know, you, you were making, making money uh, in New York and in, in, in the Big Apple. Yeah. Well, you know, my last job in finance was, was working for a hedge fund, and the work was lucrative and interesting, but I wasn't satisfied. Um, I wanted to make a bigger contribution to society and, and also to Hawaii. Okay. All right. Now, so what are you doing now? What's what's your present focus? Where are you where are you hoping to go? Well, my um, last couple of years, I've been really interested in how screens, which means, you know, smartphones, tablets, TVs, computers, all of it together, how it's affecting child development and child well-being, and and ultimately their success as adults. And so, coming up with new creative solutions and you know, getting uh, government schools and parents all involved in, in this process. Okay, so your screens, I guess you're talking about these things that we have here uh, on the table. Indeed. And, and uh, all different types of screens. And uh, so you, you left New York, you left a good profession, okay, and you came back to do something else. and. Where where are you now? I mean, what 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 got you interested in the screens? I mean, what what prompted yeah. you to to get into that area? Well, I would say it was really the convergence of these two different projects I was working on. Um, okay. The first was working for a world summit on technological unemployment. Technological unemployment is when jobs are displaced by technology through either automation or robotics. Okay, now let's say that again for me because okay. I want to make sure I understand. Technological that. unemployment is when jobs are displaced by automation or robotics. Okay, all right. So okay. I was working on a summit that we had in the fall of 2015 in New York. Um, it was the first high level gathering of pol high level policymakers, academics, and thought leaders um, to talk about this issue. And we had some really great speakers, like Robert Reich, Larry Summers, and Joseph Stiglitz. And so in addition to being the director of research, I led our education panel, which was called Educating for the Transition. And so I was sort of thinking about, well, how do we create kids that are resilient against technological unemployment? And what I came up with was this idea of focusing on human competitive advantages. 
things we do better than computers and, and look poised to continue to. Okay. Right. So these are things like deep thinking, interpersonal skills, creative problem solving. And what was a little concerning was what I was reading was that employers were complaining that these skills had actually been declining. And so I started thinking, maybe all this time we're spending with machines and devices, maybe that's making us more machine-like and sort of um, stunting these human competitive advantages. Not having the creativity that we had before we had, uh, before we had. Before we had iPads. These, the iPad. Yeah. And, and so these thoughts came to you while you were doing this project in New York. Right. Which sounds pretty, pretty substantial. Yeah. Yeah, that was one way. Uh -huh. And the other, um, I started a company called College Consciously uh, around that same time, which was focused on giving college students career and college navigation counseling. And so I was talking with a lot of kids. Um, and I noticed that they seemed more stressed and on edge than my peers had been just you know, a decade prior, roughly. And uh, I also noticed when talking to them, I was very interested in how they wanted to grow during their time in college. And uh, something that came up repeatedly was they said they wanted to be more grounded. And this also, I don't think that my peers would have said that. So it was these two kind of, um, you know, one was this intellectual pursuit on how we prepare students for the digital age, and the other was more in-person connection with college students and sort of getting a pulse for their emotional state and stress levels. So really, you've always kind of had this passion for, for kids, for students, and helping them learn. It, and, and now you discovered from employers in one sense and from the students themselves that despite having all the advantages of technology, something seemed to be missing. And that's what kind of got you thinking. Is that it? Is Definitely. Always had an interest in students and I've also long been interested in sort of the interface between technology, economy, and society. Okay. All right. And then you, you came back here and, and you're, so you were an entrepreneur. You started a company that you thought would help kids, and then you discovered something, right? And let's talk a little bit about the, the real theme of the program, and that's the counterintuitive secret that Silicon Valley elites use to help their own children thrive in the digital age. That's a long title, so that's why, why I read it. Yeah. But that intrigued me. Yeah. And, and what, what is that? What is that? So, you know, um, as I mentioned, I sort of got interested in this topic and started doing some research because I'm a, a natural researcher. And I expected screens to impact, you know, maybe attention and sleep and things like that. But when I started doing the research, I found that it really affects so much more than that. When you study child development, you realize how many, uh, how interconnected the systems are and how many unintended consequences there can be um, when you introduce a new variable into the environment or, you know, take something away. And things like um, kids' vestibular systems, which is like our balance systems, are less developed these days because they're spending so much time like this and, and with, not moving with, with around. One of these things in front of them. Exactly. The versus system. like moving around. And and <laughs> who knew, right, that a underdeveloped vestibular system that has implications for your reading ability and your emotional control and even your ability to pay attention. And just walking. So, I mean, uh, in a well, way. That, that too. Just, and that that yeah. too. Right. Yeah, yeah. But it has all these unintended consequences and. At first, honestly, I started like doubting myself because I was seeing all of these ways that children were being affected, but this was two or three years ago, and it wasn't in the media very much. Mm -hmm. So I was like, if it's having such a profound effect on kids, why aren't we talking about it? And am I creating like a, an echo chamber, you know, like a biased research bubble? And what really gave me confidence that I was onto something and that this was a big deal was this article I read by a journalist, Nick Bilton. And he interviewed Steve Jobs, and apparently he'd stepped on Jobs' toes before. And Steve Jobs is a titan. <laughs> he surely titan. is, yeah. Okay. He, um, and so he'd stepped on Steve Jobs' toes before, and so he was asking him a softball question to butter him up, right? And he said, your kids must love using the iPad. And Steve Jobs said, uh, no, they've never used it. We have tech wow. limitations in our household. And that's an understatement. He had a teenage son, never used it. That's pretty strict, you know, restrictions. Wow. Yeah. And so that's what Nick Bilton said. He was surprised, but then he realized, you know, he talked to other of these high-level executives on Silicon Valley, what I call the Silicon Valley elite, and, and thought leaders there. And this was actually a common practice. Steve Jobs was not the exception. 
he was the rule. And so that's when I knew that all of these effects that I had been seeing, they were real. And I think that that's why the Silicon Valley elite were quietly shielding their kids from the impact of excessive tech exposure. Wow, that is, I mean, that's, all, that's shocking. Yeah. In a, in a way to, to hear that Steve yeah. Jobs says, no, you can't use this. Right. Uh, and, 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 and what was, did, was there an explanation for that Steve Jobs I don't think provided? in that. He just said no. I don't think in that interview there was. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, he talked to Chris Anderson later, who is the first editor of Wired, and he talked about how he had seen friends that have fallen into it, right? Because these are also people that have been in the industry. They've seen the effects before the rest of us and have a better sense of how it affects the economy and uh, society and individuals. So Steve Jobs uh, saw what you saw. Yes. Uh, but he, so did Bill he, Gates, by the way. Uh, okay. And, and what, what, did Bill Gates have, have the same rule for his kids? He had strict rules on his, ki uh, on his kids' tech time as well. Okay. And they, they saw the, the, the same thing about employers. Well, the, these kids are not quite... The same they were. They're not a creative, perhaps. They're not as uh, as together. Human. Uh, human. Okay, there you go. And then and then you saw on your own. The, the kids were a little distracted. And what I want to ask you: Were they when they were talking to you? Were they going like this all the time? Or uh, not constantly, but they did talk. I mean, they talked about that being an issue. Yeah. You know, that's something they were somewhat cognizant yeah. of. So then then you saw the secret. Right. You 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 put it all together. Yeah. You put two and two together. Where where did you go from there? Um. Well, you know, I, I saw The Secret, and, uh, and uh, a lot of people wonder, you know, well, why exactly are they doing it? You yeah, know, more, what, more specific. What motivates them? Right. What yeah. are the benefits? And, and so I think, like all parents, they want what's best for their children, right? They want children that are, are happy and healthy and successful. And so I think that they do this because they believe it confers benefits for their children. And I'll go over three of them today. Okay. Um, the first is that it gives their kids a valuable edge in the digital economy, which is something that we already started talking about. But I think this is the point I'll spend the most time on and want to hammer home, because it's really counterintuitive to a lot of parents. A lot of parents think that to thrive in the digital age, their kids need to be on tech early, not have too many restrictions, so that they're comfortable in the digital world. But what right. these tech executives are seeing is that as children are developing, and especially in early childhood, like the first 10 years, it's far more important to hone those human competitive advantages and build those foundations. And that actually too much exposure to tech early stunts the development of it. That's very interesting because I know young parents who are saying, I want to get my kid knowledgeable as soon as possible, and the, and the little children are on their machines or on their technological uh, It's the number toys. one pushback I get from parents, right? It's like, yeah. but they're going to live in a digital world. Don't they need to know this stuff? They, and they right? do this. But, but, but the motivation behind the think tech, I mean, behind the technology giants is that we want our children to have a little bit of human, humanity. Uh, humanity uh -huh. and those are also valuable skills again. These are what you know employers want. Mm -hmm. And so things like deep thinking are undermined by the constant distractions that tech bombards kids with and, and adults for that matter. Um, empathy, you know, they've done research where they take just screens away from kids for five days and they score significantly better on reading nonverbal cues than they do prior to their break. And things like problem solving, things that I learned studying child development, a lot of the foundations for that are from unstructured play. And as screen time has gone up, free play has gone down. Um, and you know, something else, like I know a lot of people out there are probably thinking, well, I can't argue that um, empathy and problem solving are, are good, like clearly they are, but what about these tech skills that are so in demand, like coding? And I think that's a great question. Well, let's wait and answer that question after our break. Okay. And, Sounds good. And, and also, uh, I, I do want to uh, also hear more about these tech billionaires, and, and I, I want—I may ask you why they keep it a secret. Okay. So we'll take a short break right now and come back and talk some more. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always 
a joy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. We are back with Lauren Pear talking about the secrets that the tech billionaires have, and are the, the, really the secret that they have, and that they use to help their children be successful in the digital age. And we left off, Lauren, you were talking about some of the benefits and motivations, so please continue. Yeah, so, um, you know, we were talking about how uh, having all this exposure to, to tech um, undermines these human competitive advantages. And then that you know a response that's that's frequently would you know um, would be given by parents is well what about coding these are really important skills right and so no doubt that's true but what I would argue is if you look under the tech veneer of something like coding what you see down there is or what really makes a good coder is these human competitive right. advantages that I was mentioning earlier things like deep thinking and creative problem solving and grit. And if you actually Google what it takes to make a good coder, um, you'll find that. What you won't find is, is people saying you need to be on hours a day, every day, starting at you know, age six or seven or eight. And that's because you know, coders, they get a problem, they have to sit down with it, think of different ways to solve it, think forward to see um, obstacles that are going to come up, pick a solution, and build. And the reason patience and grit is so important with coding is for everyone, anyone who has coded, it's very persnickety and precise. So if you put a semicolon instead of a colon, that can break your whole code. And then you have to go through and figure out where that little mistake was. It's called debugging. So if you don't have patience and an attention span, you're not going to be a good coder. And, and there's actually one other thing that I think coding can really enlighten us on. And that is um, how counterintuitively limited tech can make people more efficient and really sharpen their tech skills. Um, a while ago, I was reading this book, Flash Boys, by Michael Lewis, which is on high frequency trading, which is a very tech heavy corner of finance. And so they have a lot of coders. And the main character, or one of the characters, was trying to, he noticed that the best coders were Russian. And he was trying to figure out why this was. And finally, one of the Russian coders enlightened him. He said, Well, our cohort of coders, we grew up in the Soviet Union, and we had very little computer time. So before we got on our computer time, we'd spent a lot of time making our code elegant, which means concise, and easy to debug. And it's these same traits that made them the best coders that were so in demand by Goldman Sachs and all the other big banks. And so counterintuitively, that limited time made them more efficient and sharpen their tech schools, skills. And I would argue that that's true for kids. If kids have a limited time, they're going to be very intentional about how they use that time and more efficient. If they have all the time in the world, Nothing's pressuring them to be efficient, and it's very possible they're going to unconsciously um, just consume and consume and consume. And so being more, more human is what the tech giants are trying to help their children. And to be more successful in the, in yes. the tech world doesn't mean concentrating more on tech. It means maybe concentrating on some of the human values that, that actually help. And I, and I think that concentrating on those human values allow kids to take better advantage of tech later when they're more developed, right? So it's not that tech right. isn't important, but protecting from excessive tech allows them to um, yeah, use technology better when they're older, as their tool rather than their master. And I'll jump into the second benefit, which is um, that it really helps their kids reach their academic potential. Now, screens in school is a rich topic. We don't have much time. But I will talk about two areas that are increasingly holding a lot of kids back from reaching their academic potential, and that's executive function problems and mental health issues. And so executive function, for people that don't know, it's an umbrella term for high-level thinking we do, planning, organization, motivation, emotional regulation. It's in our prefrontal cortex, and it's called our control center. And there is um, research that suggests that you know, uh, a lot of tech exposure can, can impact um, the executive functioning skills. 
And it's actually everything that affects attention affects his executive functioning, you know. And I, I also think it's kind of concerning the. There's been a bit of research on video games, and they find that um, heavy gamers have less gray matter here in the prefrontal mm. cortex. <laughs> and we find that boys are, you know, executive function has become a bit of a buzzword around schools. And that's because they're seeing a lot more problems with it, and particularly among boys. And boys are consuming a lot of video games. So I'm not saying it's just video games, but it's concerning. Um, and, and so, so the. Tech giants are saying, again, that this is another thing. I don't want you to be on the machines too much because I want you to develop these skills. Exactly. They want to, to shield to protect so that these skills can out. develop. Yeah. The, the thing, the, I, yeah. I think they figured it out. Yeah. And then the other one is, is mental health issues, mm -hmm. which is also increasingly holding a lot of kids back from, from you know, um, being the, having the, from their academic potential, really. And, that's also, I think, the third benefit. It would slide into the third benefit. Yeah. And that, uh, I think, is, you know, all parents want their kids to be happy, well-adjusted, healthy. And um, just throwing out a few facts on what's happening with adolescent and child mental well-being, it's, it's really um, sad and alarming. You know, uh, 20 years ago, of disabled kids, only something like 5 or 6% of them were disabled due to mental health reasons. Now it's 50%. Wow. Right, that's a tenfold increase. Bipolar diagnoses in young people is up 20 to 40 times what it used to be. And we're also just seeing skyrocketing anxiety and depression um, and manifesting most seriously and, and tragically in suicide. Teen suicide have been on an upward tear between 2007 and, and 2015. The suicide rate for teenage girls doubled, fully doubled. And for boys over that period, it's up 30%, which is still a lot and, and very stark. And we've all heard about the, the connection between some technology and suicide. True, yeah? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. have. And, and there are a number of ways that, that technology can affect mental health. You know, one, that kids don't have a break from social stress anymore because they're always connected. So right. home isn't the refuge it used to be even 15 years ago. Because they go right on their... Screen. Exactly, so they never escape, right? Another is it disrupts sleep and dysregulates their nervous system. It actually creates a lot of stress in their in their nervous system and their bodies that parents really um, underestimate. You know, it also uh, displaces time for human contact, which texting and messaging they don't have the same emotional benefits to us as as in person communication. And, um, and there are a few other ways that it affects, too. And I'm not saying it's 100% responsible by a long shot, but I think that there's more than enough evidence to act. And to me, it seems like at this point, the burden of proof is that it doesn't cause harm. And uh, not, not that you should have to prove beyond a speck of doubt that it is causing harm. And the tech uh, elites seem to agree. So, uh, so your position is you, you, you've seen some, you, you feel there's a connection. Uh, between the technology and some things that are not um, helping, and I've read develop. research that that suggests there's a connection okay. as well. Okay, and and uh, there's probably good and bad involved in technology. We'll agree on that. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of true. what you're saying. Uh, and uh, one one um, really quick thing I'll interject too. You know, if if people have kids that have behavioral issues or, or psychological issues, and and they think it might be connected to screens, digital fasts. Um, can really turn kids around. So it's not all, okay. you know. L let's talk a little bit about that. So you, you, you say that uh, these tech billionaires, executives, th these guys who developed, you know, things, uh, Steve Jobs and right. those folks, they're telling their children, uh, let's lay off this so much. Right. Okay. Uh, what benefits or how, how do you how do you tell parents nowadays to do that or, or how, how do parents nowadays do that same thing what 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 tips can, well, you, can you give them yeah I mean as far as tips I would I would suggest two uh, mindset tips and maybe I'll, I'll throw out three tactical tips so for the mindset tips I mean the first thing for parents today is just like remember that you're in charge and also, you have a right to change. I know, it sounds obvious, oh, but a yeah. lot of parents forget, you know? And also, you have the right to change your mind based on new information on what you think is appropriate screen time, you know? So that's really important for parents to remember. Second, I encourage parents to think about it as a family solution. 
And what this really does is help kids buy in. And by family solution, I mean that the parents' habits are on the table too. They gotta be involved too. And exactly. It's not just the kids. Exactly, I because see. kids complain and complain <laughs> about parent hypocrisy, right? The parents are saying, you can never be on, but the parents are always on themselves. Right. And on top of that, to be honest, uh, modeling behaviors is the most potent way of learning. So if you're on all the fo your phone all the time, your kids are gonna pick up on They're that. They're gonna see that. They're gonna see, and, and it's gonna affect them and how they act. But conversely, if you are non-defensive when you're talking about your tech habits and you try to make changes, that's also gonna affect them. It's gonna make them easier for them to do it as well. And, and I think that through this idea of family solutions, you can really um, make it something that draws the family closer versus something that uh, is constantly creating conflict. As far as the tr three tactical tips, um, the first I would say is taking away your uh, kids' devices at night. Take them away at night, uh, ideally two hours or so before they go to bed. So um, they're under the covers. Yes, yeah. they don't have the prefrontal cortex development to self-regulate and they will go on. It will ruin their sleep, which uh, you know affects every other aspect of development. I would also suggest some, some um, articles will tell you you can like leave them in common spaces like the kitchen or the living room. I say keep it in your room because I've talked to multiple parents where the kids sneak <laughs> it, if it's, so don't risk that. Um, the second thing that I would say is that uh, download a tracking app for yourself and your kids, something like Moment, um, just so that most people really underestimate how much they're on their phones and how much their kids are on their phones. And I, I would sort of tack that as a habit onto the first one when your kids check in their phone for the night, look over with them, just spend two or three minutes so that they're cognizant too of how much time they're spending on their phone. And actually, you don't even need moment if you have an iPhone and do it every night. Uh, if you go in the settings, battery, it will show you for the last 24 hours how much time you've spent and on what apps okay. you're on. So that's, that's the second piece of advice. And the last? And the last one I would say is, you know, schedule like a family fun activity that's screen free once a week. Go that makes for it more a hike. positive. Exactly. <laughs> go for a hike, without go to the your beach phone. Without, without your phone. Yeah. Or you know, one parent can have it as a timepiece, but yeah, a, a rule with like no I tech see. allowed. And um, and if it's terrible weather or you just can't motivate that day, then play a board game or a card game. It's it's really important for kids to to have family fun, and that's sort of a more positive way to interject positive family experiences versus always being about limiting and restricting. I seem to remember when I was a kid, that's what we would do. Uh, right. Now, you know, in the in the, the 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 minute we have left, tell me what your thoughts are and where you want this to go? What's your vision? Oh, a minute is, is tough for that. Know. But um, yeah, so you know, my vision is um, that government can play a role in uh, funding research and getting you know, public health uh, education out there. But I think the most important role is the family. Everything starts at home. And that this can really, there's a way to address it where it makes the family closer and doesn't have to create a lot of conflict. I also really want to see more collaboration between right beneath the family is school, because kids spend so much time in school, they're so affected by their peers. So I want to see schools and families working together to create um, you know, more positive tech and media cultures in the schools. And personally, I've been working on a few um, concrete solutions for parents. Um, the first is a parent mastermind. This idea is that uh, I'll get a small group of parents, we will meet weekly for a month, um, I'll have a mini lecture, we'll have a discussion where everyone gets to talk about what's worked and hasn't worked for them, and, uh, and over the month each parent will have one opportunity to be on the hot seat where they'll be able to bring a specific question to the group and me and all the other group members will focus on helping them solve that problem. As far as I'm aware of, this has never been done before. A uh, number of parents have been really interested in this and asking for this. And so um, if anyone out there is interested, um, please email me. We'll be putting our, my email up okay. and, uh, and let me know and I'll put you on the list. And also tell me how old your kids are. Okay, quickly, the second solution that uh, I'm working on is a solution guide. It's compiling solutions from uh, different sources that I've been researching, parents, books, articles. I think of it as a menu that parents can pick from to create a system that works for them. Um, it will go over uh, things like other things you can do other than uh, being on screen time, which is a huge question I get asked. You know, how to set up a screen time contract, which I think is a great um, solution for parents, some of the best apps. 
uh, ways to mitigate, um, you know, kids' uh, resistance and to get them on board. And so um, that is a, okay. a early bird uh, price of thirty-five dollars. You can email me if you're interested in All that right. too. Lauren, I really and I, there's one more thing I have to say, Mark, which is that I'm the last thing I'm doing. And I'm sorry if it's going over. Is that um, uh, doing some sessions with parents. Uh, on screen time, and for people watching, I'm going to give away 10 half an hour sessions for parents. We'll go over a specific question or, or challenge they have with screens and come up with practical, um, actionable solution points. Lauren, thank you very much. I learned the secret and I am glad to have it. Thank you very much. Aloha. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark.